Hey, welcome everybody. It's Sven Hosford again with the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine doing another podcast here for October 14th, 2014. And uh, just a reminder that our print issue is out there in yoga studios, health food stores, and waiting rooms all over Western Pennsylvania. And if you would like some extra copies, give me a call or uh, actually drop me an email, svenhosford at gmail.com. And uh, we're getting the winter issue together. That'll come out December 1st. If you are a professional, would like to be involved with that, give me uh, an email again, svenhosford at gmail.com. And uh, I'll get you some information about advertising in the winter issue. Uh, coming up in this podcast, Jim Donovan lived the life of a rock and roll, uh, lived the rock and roll life that every teenager dreams of. And uh, that was as the drummer for Rusted Root. And he opened for some of the biggest names in the business in the late 90s and early 2000s. Well, he's going to tell the story of how a panic attack uh, on stage in front of 30,000 people and Carlos Santana uh, turned out to be a good thing ultimately. And it's just absolutely the best rock and roll story you'll ever hear. And you're going to hear it coming up in this podcast. Jim is also going to talk about how those kinds of lessons helped him become a professor and drum and music circle leader and how he teaches uh, those kinds of lessons to students today. And of course, we are talking those lessons of lowering cortisol, boosting endorphins, entrainment of the nervous system to slow down your brain. And you thought I was going to say sex and drugs and rock and roll. It's a really, really good interview. You're really going to enjoy it. And that's coming up in this podcast. Coming up uh, next week, another great interview. Looking forward to this. Dr. Nancy Mrammer is going to be here. And she is going to talk about her new book, Get Real, Produce Your Life. Uh, it's uh, She's a wonderful uh, psycho psychologist and a media specialist and a good friend of mine for many decades now. Well, maybe not that many decades. And uh, looking forward to hearing about the new book. And in two weeks, another uh, amazing interview. I can't believe all these people actually line up and uh, want to talk to me. It's uh, Dan Libby. He is a PhD and an RYT. He's executive director of the Veterans Yoga Project. And he's come into town to teach a class for yoga teachers on how to work with veterans with PTSD. Absolutely amazing and holy work. I'm really looking forward to that. So let's take a look at the calendar of interest for wellness professionals in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, coming up actually in New York, just a short drive away, this weekend is Heal Thy Practice. We've had Eric uh, Goldman, uh, one of the co-producers on this podcast, uh, htpconference.com coming up this weekend. And also this weekend on Saturday night, it's Know Your GMOs. That's coming up at CMU. Uh, Eastendfood.coop is more information. And of course, our podcast last week and the video that's up on YouTube uh, with our conversation with Justin Pizzella. Uh, over uh, the end of this month and into November, if you're probably uh, too late to get the class you want to, but maybe there's still room, is uh, the NRT class at uh, Pittsburgh School of Massage Therapy and also the uh, CE conference at Seven Springs coming up on the 2nd through the 4th, the 2nd to 4th of November. PGHSCHMASS.com to find out more about that. Uh, great guests we've had. If you haven't had a chance, I'm telling you, go back and watch the podcast with Dean Juhan and uh, Ralph Stevens. The two of the presenters are going to be here uh, for that uh, conference in, in Seven Springs. Two of the most amazing body workers uh, you will ever hear on a podcast, uh, I promise you. So also coming up uh, November 6th, uh, we'll be there with uh, Trenton Nazipak and Get Organically Social. It's uh, Vonda Wright, Dr. Vonda Wright, and the Women's Health Conversations. Uh, go to womenshealthconversations.com to find out more about that on November 6th. And also on November 15th is Juice Fest. Uh, organically social, a uh, great deals and discounts network for health and wellness businesses is uh, throwing uh, just <laughs> looks like it's going to be a great party uh, on a Saturday from 11 to 3. We're also going to organize, uh, we are organizing the meetup group. Meetup.com has the integrative medicine professionals. And so far, I think we're up to eight of our 145 members. Come on, guys, let's uh, let's get out and meet each other. Uh, that's coming up November 15th. So check out meetup.com, Integrative Medicine Professionals, 
if you are a professional of any sort and interested in meeting others of the same ilk. So that is it for the calendar this week. Coming up next, the interview I had earlier today with Jim Donovan. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are once again with Jim Donovan. I'm Sven Hosford with the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. Jim Donovan, old friend of mine, and you probably know him as the former drummer of Rusted Root. He is also now a professor at St. Francis University, teaching, of all things, drumming. How are you doing today, Jim? Oh, fantastic. How about yourself? I'm just doing great. Uh, it's always a good day when we're talking about drumming. It's one of my favorite subjects. Oh, yeah. So um, we had a little, sh we had a short interview a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about uh, an event that you had coming up at Mount Pleasant. Uh, I wondered if you would kind of recap what that event, event was about, and uh, and then tell us who was there and who learned what and how good of a time you had. Yeah, sure. So we did uh, my my three day training called Sound Empowerment, and that was here in Western Pennsylvania at a beautiful retreat center called Laurelville. I had people that came in from all over the eastern United States, so as far away as uh, Binghamton, New York, uh, Ohio, uh, of course, uh, uh, here in Pennsylvania. And uh, the premise of the whole weekend, it really it had sort of a dual use. Some, came, some people came as, as a retreat just for themselves, while others came uh, to help augment some of the things that they do in their professional practices. I had uh, a really nice collection of people. I had people that were uh, behavioral health care specialists, so, so people that were uh, psychologists and therapists came. Uh, I had some people that worked with children with disabilities, uh, several people uh, fit that, mm -hmm. and then some, uh, some early educators too. So it was a really a very, very nice mix of people. And the idea was to give uh, the participants a system. So Sound Empowerment is, is a system that shows people how to utilize uh, very simple yet very effective sound interventions as well as rhythmic interventions uh, with the people that they work with. These interventions can range from simple vocalizations of so simple vocal sounds like toning and mantra uh, all the way to uh, introductory drum circle facilitation. So actually getting people making music together. And the premise of all my teachings and all my trainings is that you, do, you don't need to be a musician to do them and to use them. Uh, there's no reading music. It's all based on uh, the most natural parts of, of being human, which is, uh, which is our, our language. And you really do develop that uh, communication. And uh, as we've talked about before, one of the most powerful skills you learn both for professional and personal use is the power of listening. Yes. Uh, it's a vastly underused and under understood skill that we seem to have uh, as far as our personal skills. Tell us about how that flourished during your weekend. It's really key anytime we are working with human beings. I like to think of the, the room that I'm in and the people in the room are all uh, almost like little puzzles to figure out. And one of the, the key pieces to figuring out the puzzle of each person is to both watch, listen, and uh, really to observe the body language and, and follow through and engagement. Uh, a, a big part of what I teach people in, in any training I do is, is how to bring the best out in people. Uh, the ability to listen deeply is, is one part of a, of a much bigger pie there. Bringing out the best in people, uh, that has got to be uh, such a fulfilling part of what you do and, and all the work you do. It is. It's, it is really, to me, uh, more important than any of the tools that I teach. Uh, underneath, underneath every training is, is this, this idea that there's any number of ways to help someone really understand who they are at their core. Uh, that authentic self. And what I've found in my own experience is that music and, uh, and, and sound, drumming, these, these tools are really effective at helping people to, to learn how to take off the mask and just be with each other, irregardless of the, the typical limitations or the typical boxes we put ourselves in. So the boxes of 
social status or sex or, uh, or race or religion. It's amazing how quickly a group of people who don't know each other can create something together if we give them the right setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the authentic self, I'm guessing that many times when people find that within themselves, it's a much more uh, glorious and much more, use some, uh, some bigger words there, it's much bigger and much more powerful than they, than they thought it would be. Or it's much different, much more expanded, much more divine than they thought it would be. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I personally, I go in and out of it all the time. Uh, and I catch myself, the, I feel like the older that I get, the more I can be in it, especially when I'm adhering to uh, you know, my different practices, whether that's meditation or just really taking good care of myself. If I'm not having to manage uh, extraneous stress that, that really doesn't need to be there, it lets me sit in that spot. And, and what's nice about that is there's a lot of peace there. Mm. There isn't... Uh, there isn't so much noise and I can just feel uh, the, the words equanimity. And it's this idea of, of feeling uh, that all is well, even when there's a crisis. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what I, one of the big things I like to teach people is how to, how to manage folks in a way that allows them to discover that for themselves. And there's something truly transcendent in the idea of a, a drummer honoring and and being in bliss in the silence yeah exactly so um we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about your uh, rock and roll career later actually we're gonna tell you're gonna tell the best rock and roll story i've ever heard okay. uh, and i'm really looking forward to that hearing that again uh, but you're now uh, after a, a career in rock and roll and, and let's say you guys like you were pretty big. You opened for the Grateful Dead. You opened for Carlos Santana, mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin. Uh, you were on Letterman. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much when you were growing up and imagining yourself uh, as a rock and roll star, did you? Was it as good as you imagined? It was better. <laughs> it was better. It, it, what was interesting is that uh, the dreams that I held as a, as a teenager, uh, right around 1994-95 all came true at once wow. and and then started to surpass what I had initially dreamt would happen. And it was, it was interesting to find myself in that space where, wow, I, I need to dream a little bigger here because it was, <laughs> I already, I already passed up what I thought would, or what I hoped would happen. Well, that's a, that's a rare thing. I think for a lot of people, no matter what their, what their dream is to surpass their dream uh, that, that early on, but you had a great career, and now you are actually, uh, help me out, you're the head of the department now, Fine Arts Department uh, for St. Francis, is that right? Yeah, I, I just took over that position this, this semester, and uh, we're going through a big rebuild, and so I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of leadership skills to practice, which is a lot of fun. Uh, recently got uh, a Master's of Education leadership, and so that's been helping a lot, having that, that background sure. uh, to be able to do that well. And uh, we say that because I want to go through kind of a, a conversation about uh, kind of a checklist and say, you know, drumming and rhythm making and noise making and group music making has been shown to be effective for blank. And then let's fill in some of these blanks and say, is it good for this? Uh, does it work with this? How does it work with that? And come at it from both, you know, your personal experience you know, as, as being in a rock and roll band, but also in as a uh, group facilitator for so many years. Yep. But then also as an educator, uh, you know, you've got some of the the scientific gravitas. Uh, you 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 know Barry Bittman up there in Meadville, who's done the very first research uh, yep. on drumming in the world, as far as I know. Yes. Uh, so let's cover so let's cover these from both perspectives. You know, personal experience and the science. Uh, when people get together and drum, um, you know, uh, one of the things that we'll tell them, this will be a part of the story is, is just the, the first thing is just to be able to do it, to overcome that performance anxiety. That's right. Uh, talk about that a little bit. That's one of the key uh, pieces that I encounter, that I've been encountering uh, for as long as I've been working with people is the vast majority, not 
not everyone, but the vast majority walk in with some sort of resistance about doing it because they've got this belief that, well, maybe I can't, or maybe I don't have rhythm, or maybe someone told me one time, uh, you're not rhythmic, so you shouldn't. And you know, I, I take it upon myself as, as my job to help flip that attitude so that they might have an opportunity to see what's possible. And I, I think one of the reasons I've had some success is that I, I, I figured out how to make it uh, accessible to people. It's, it's one, of, one of the pillars of what I call drum circle le leadership is finding a way to bring in the person who is resisting. Uh, or finding a way to bring in the person who has a challenge. You know, so maybe I've got someone there with only the use of one arm, or I've got someone there who has autism, or I've got a group of kids who can't hear anything because uh, they, they've they got uh, hearing loss. Mm. So I always take it upon myself is, you know, well, what do I got to do here to help bring them in? Uh, mm. And what people find is that if, if, a, if a facilitator sets up the experience well, that uh they can do it and the way that i do it well is just i give them a simple uh, a simple direction and that is anytime you feel like you've made a mistake the rule is to smile and just keep going <laughs> and what i find is that one little sentence works like a charm it's like a, it's like a magic key that that helps someone go oh wait a minute the instructor says it's okay then maybe i'll think it's okay too that'd be, that'd be a great thing to apply to all life wouldn't it Maybe. <laughs> Just smile and keep on doing it. I'll keep on going. <laughs> That's right. Well, this has got to be, uh, I mean, Carlos, uh, we're going to tell the story here. You're going to tell the story is really gave you the best lesson ever on overcoming that performance anxiety. Do you think that's why you're so good at that and being able to draw people in like that? Uh, there's nothing like failing miserably <laughs> to, to be able to learn the value of it. Because in inside of every failure I've ever had uh, is is really big gold, mm, and, uh, yeah. and that's you know we'll we'll hear about that in the story I tell. Uh, but but yes, I th I think that's that informs uh, a good piece of it. Yeah. So it's like in, so from the scientific uh, perspective as well, drumming has been shown to overcome all kinds of anxiety and depressions, not just uh, performance anxiety. Is that right? That's right. There's there are multiple studies that show how effective both uh, drumming on your own and drumming in groups, uh, how how effective it is at reducing stress and improving well-being. I, th I think the the most studies that 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 I've seen out there uh, show show that that piece of of stress reduction, uh, well-being increase. And specifically, um, Barry Bittman's studies, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, talked about having the exact numbers of how much the cortisol levels came down after an hour of drumming. That's with, right. They, they went as far as me measuring all that stuff uh, on, on the hormonal level and were able to show you know, physiologically there, there is a change that happens. And, and I can... I can put that in, in simple terms, just if, if you don't have a medical background, I, I don't, um, uh, but it helps you to understand one thing that rhythm does, especially a, a repeating rhythm, like if I'm playing this, and if I keep it going long enough, what the brain does, because it loves patterns so much, is that it realizes, oh, there's a repeating pattern there. And the longer it goes, uh, the brain essentially does, and this is very simplified, the brain goes, ah, they're going to keep that thing going. Okay, well, if they're going to keep that going, then I can be back here relaxing. So in essence, this particular rhythm, so this, this, this tempo, this speed, musicians would call the 16th notes at 60 beats a minute. The rest of us, this is a ticking stopwatch. Mm -hmm. And what we've uh, what we've seen the the concept is called rhythmic entrainment. When we give the brain this particular tempo, what happens is that it has the effect of slowing the speed of the brain wave down. Yeah. So when we're in stress or when we're in anxiety, the the speed of the brain wave increases significantly. Uh, children on the autism spectrum, one of the reasons why they have challenge focusing is that the speed of their brain wave is quick. 
and it mm. makes it very hard to, to maintain attention to task. But what we found uh, through a, a number of studies is that when we give the brain a rhythm to latch onto, it helps that wave to slow down. Uh, some of the research we've done here at St. Francis that, that, that I've helped design, uh, we were able to show an increase in attention to task uh, in, in children on, on the spectrum of over 189% after 10 weeks. Wow. And these interventions were facilitated by occupational therapists without musical background. And so the thing about this is, is that uh, we're, I believe, at the, at the cusp of rediscovering uh, very ancient technology, things that have been happening for tens of thousands of years all over the globe, independently of uh, each other. So when I see that, when I see that there's, there's proof all over the planet that there have been uh, drums, that there have been people gathering in circles, when they've been singing, when they've been saying repetitious chants and mantras, that tells me there's got to be something important because things don't last that don't work. Yeah. Really, every culture, uh, every culture on every continent uses that concept. I mean, we all grew out of villages where there was group circles and, and group music making or, of some sort. That's right. And you know, to, to finish up the, the, the thought about the stress and the cortisol, one thing I forgot to mention is that when we slow the speed of the brainwave down, uh, we, in essence, help to turn on the relaxation response. So when we're in stress, when the brainwave is quick, uh, it releases chemicals, so cortisol and adrenaline in particular, throughout the entire system so that uh, you know, we can manage whatever's stressing us out. So the stress is there to help us stay on the planet. So it's important. We need it. But the problem is, is that in our society now, so many of us are constantly in the stress response that our bodies are being overloaded with stress and cortisol, which if we don't manage well, uh, end up having the effect of breaking down the bodily systems, especially uh, the cells in the brain. So too much stress, too much cortisol has the effect of killing brain cells. Mm. So when we drum, when we slow the speed of the brain wave down, we essentially short circuit the stress response and turn on relaxation. And the best part is that it's natural and the only side effect is that maybe maybe your neighbors get mad. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they come over and join in. Or they come and join in, which would be even better. So is it that particular speed that slowers uh, the, the the nervous system down or have other speeds been tested or? Um, I've, I've heard of other speeds being tested in, in general, that, that particular speed, uh, it matches the resting heartbeat. So it's, 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 it, it aligns with that well, as I understand it. I also know that in general, and this is kind of common knowledge, but just in general, the slower the rhythm, the slower or the more relaxing effect it has on the body. I, that's what I would think. Yeah, that's the what quicker, the more stimulating it is. And uh, somewhere right in the middle, it, the more it helps us to focus. Okay. So if we've got something really fast, it will stimulate. Too slow, it'll relax us in the middle, focus. We, you said the word entrainment, and that's where I wanted to get to next, is to talk about how uh, that rhythm of a bunch of people doing that rhythm builds that group entrainment and how that works as a uh, team building leadership, uh, all sorts of uh, corporate exercises, that sort of thing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, so entrainment, this, this is just a, a way of saying that, that we as a human being have aligned with a pattern or a rhythm. Uh, we experience entrainment all the time. So if you've ever done the wave at a football game, or if you've ever been dancing, if you've ever done anything uh, in conjunction with someone that was like an identical movement, you've experienced rhythmic entrainment. And what happens in, in groups is that uh, it's very powerful. So I, I do mass events sometimes for as many as a thousand people at a time. And to get a thousand people in an auditorium all boom, 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 boom together uh, is, the feeling of it is a feeling of awe because 
I might not know the person 20 rows over from me, but we're still doing and creating something together. Mm -hmm. And just that piece uh, for some folks is, is uh, very profound uh, b because we show in that experience that it doesn't matter uh, what box we put each other in. It doesn't matter, you know, what the, if it's the CEO and the janitor in the same room for, for a really, uh, for the period that we're doing it, we're all on the same level. We're all on the same uh, boat together. And I, uh, I really love the metaphor of that. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a big key to getting, getting more peace between people. And, and the other tool from a corporate standpoint, of course, we talked about a little bit about listening. So uh, that's all about building communications. And um, I think having that uh, other language besides just words, you know, or body language or how do you look, um, having a new tool of communication within a group of people must open up some interesting uh, communication. It's it's a uh, it's interesting to to help to have people communicate in a different way. It also helps people to to see each other in a different way uh, that maybe they're not used to. You know, typically we see each other in the office or we have a meeting or we're on a on a conference call. Uh, but to be in a room physically with someone and create something with them, especially something that that helps uh, foster a deep relaxation, like the the exercise I just showed you. Mm -hmm. is uh, it's a powerful experience and it's it's um, not done very often mm -hmm. the other piece that it helps foster is 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 willingness so working with anybody requires listening but it also requires willingness to do it in the first place mm -hmm. willingness to listen a willingness to uh, collaborate a willingness to share information uh, and to teach and to be taught mm -hmm. And with the uh, with the release of endorphins that happens, uh, I, I can testify to that. Uh, there must be a building of the tolerance for our capacity to hold joy and bliss. Mm -hmm. I think that whenever whenever we start to feel the the good stuff in 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 drumming, so what you're talking about is the the physiological chemical changes, the oxytocin, the nitric oxide. Those things increase when we when we turn on the relaxation. If we add singing to that, or if we add toning or chanting, that feeling of uh, physiological bliss increases. Hmm. Every time we we tone, every time we chant, every time we sing, we stimulate a nerve called the vagus nerve. And what happens is that that nerve is connected in the in the in the brain, goes the whole way down through the throat and through every major system in the body. And when we stimulate it, it has the effect of sending the message to the brain, release the feel good chemicals. So uh, people, you know, we can get all new agey and talk about the bliss and all that stuff, which I love to do. Um, Ask any Baptist choir, you know. And, but what, ha what happens physiologically really explains that feeling. Uh, and it's what's, I, what I love the most about it is that anybody can make that, that experience or they can you can get that effect to happen even if you aren't good at it mm -hmm. even if you aren't a good singer even if you don't like the sound of your voice even if you have no rhythm whatsoever you can turn that response on and that's uh what i'm finding is a really big we'll call it a selling point mm -hmm. that gets people to think oh maybe i should try this out you know what do i have to lose yeah uh you know, in their head, potential embarrassment, but on the other hand, unlimited capacity for joy and bliss. That's a nice side effect. It's a good side effect. And, and uh, it's interesting because when we're all together and we're working together, uh, most people, uh, even though they think everyone's watching them, everyone's only watching themselves. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> So is there any, anything we haven't covered, any big topic uh, that, you know, research is going into or that you're, you're working with in the area of yeah, drama? A couple, a couple other, other places that I can just mention. Uh, I'm, I've been doing some, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> got a little frog. <laughs> got got you all choked up. Huh? I'm so excited. Uh, I'm doing some work in addiction recovery environments. Uh, I'm on, on the board of a, of a company called uh, Maryland Recovery Partners. Uh, based out in, in Bel Air, Maryland, which is near Baltimore. 
And I go down there monthly and I work with uh, people who are recovering and in detox, uh, mostly from heroin addiction, uh, some alcohol, some pills, some combined. And, uh, and what, we are, uh, what we are working with are people who, uh, as, as, I, as I see it and as, as the therapist explained to me, people that just have very low confidence uh, you know, if you imagine if you're in a rehab, there's there's a lot of shame attached to that. Uh, probably a lot of uh, challenge at home because uh, of all the, the the problems that having to go away creates. And so, uh, really helping helping folks get a sense of self, get a sense of you know I I can do something, you know, and give them a place to start that is arts based that is not perfection based which is uh, i think another big key we we never strive for perfection uh instead we look at how can we progress here so that's that's a key difference between the way i teach music and the way i was taught which is the western classical system of either it's perfect or it's wrong and therefore not valid so this is this that's is a true key difference a lot of music and anybody that was taught music growing up, that's, those are your only two choices, perfect or wrong. Do it right, do what's on the page and do it with precision, which is good. And I'm a product of it and I improve because of it. So if you're a professional I, musician, it's, it's pretty important. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and the problem is, as I see it in the, in this overarching problem is that there isn't much attention, if any, given to creation. So, so the, the big attractor to music for a lot of folks is so I can make something. And so what, you know, what we do in, in addiction, recovery, what I do with, uh, with my students at St. Francis, what I do at a corporate environment is give people the opportunity to make something that they can call their own and to get the, the confidence that comes from that, uh, to get the camaraderie that comes from making it with people. And it just gives people a whole other way to to experience uh, social interaction. Um, so that's that's another another piece of the research that we see is that that group drumming, especially group improvised or creative music, uh, is is a key way to help increase social connection between people. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about the the work that we do at St. Francis with autism and attention to task. Right. Uh, let's see what else you said disabled children at one point are you doing anything actively i've done i've done uh, a good bit of work in uh, situations where we've got children who have uh, a variety of disabilities uh, autism spectrum disorders are are one of the key ones i've also worked with with adults with with autism as well as uh, adults with down syndrome how about ADHD, is it? Uh, ADHD, is, ADHD is one of the spectrum disorders, and so they, so okay. I kind of lump them all in that same place. Uh, the spectrum is very, very long and right. it has right. everywhere from not very high functioning to, to very high functioning Asperger's. So that, that's what I, I, I term that as. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a pretty full plate. Um, you're doing some pretty amazing work. And uh, let's let's get right to it. You one of the reasons uh, I believe that you're so um, I don't know you're so anchored and grounded in this work. It's not just the work you did, but all of the important lessons you got from some some pretty cool people out there on the road. Yes. Let's uh, tell us the story of uh, one of the tour you did with Carlos Santana and and how he taught you a very important lesson. I'd be happy to. So. We had uh, the band I played in Rusted Root and I, we had the opportunity to open up for Carlos Santana uh, on two separate occasions. So we, we actually did two, two summer tours with him. One in, I believe it was 1997 and again in 2002. So this story is 1997. And I remember the, the night that I found out we were gonna be opening for Santana. I got the call from our manager and he told us and I about dropped the phone. Uh, Santana is a guy who I used to write on my notebook. I used to write band names on my notebook rather than, than pay attention. 
and uh, Santana was one of the real big ones I had I had written out. I loved uh, loved Santana. I, I you know I saw him in 1980. Uh-huh. I was in the sixth row, and I thought God had given up his day job and taken up guitar with a rock and roll band. He is so amazing, yes. and it's not just that, but he's got this reputation, well deserved, for fostering young talent. I think this is an important preface to your story is that, you know, if you look at the old uh, Woodstock uh, video, I believe uh, the, the teenager playing guitar went on to play with Journey. Is that right, Steve Sean or Neil Sean? I think, I think you're right. Yeah. And Greg Rowley too. So exactly. he's, there he is on Woodstock with teenagers. You know, he was only what, 23 at the time, some scrawny kid from Tijuana. Yep. But he has this real passion for building people around him. So Take up the story there. And that's, and that's what makes him a great leader. Mm-hmm. So, so fast forward to the very first night of the tour. Uh, I remember getting off of our tour bus and walking into the amphitheater. We're, we're in Idaho, in Boise. And uh, I start walking up towards the stage area. And I, and I see this guy walking towards me. And he's got a hat on. He's got a cigar. And, and I, I quickly realize, oh, my God, that's Carlos Santana. And uh, I start to get very starstruck. Which which is is odd for me because I've I've met so many people that was kind of old hat but for some reason I was I was kind of kind of shaking, and he walks up to me and uh, and he looks at me and says Oh you're one of those Russian Root guys, and I said Yeah, <laughs> and he said You know so welcome to the tour we're so happy to have you, uh, you know we have this tradition that when we have opening bands on the tour with us that we'd like you to come up and play a song with us Do you think you and the band would like to do that. And I said, oh, yes, that would be great. So he thought of a couple songs, and he said, oh, do you know uh, Bob Marley's Exodus? And I said, sure, we know Exodus. Everybody's know, everybody knows Exodus. And uh, we bid each other farewell, and uh, he told me when to come up. And so I went back to the bus and told the rest of the band, I said, you're not going to believe this, but Carlos just asked us to play on stage with him tonight. Man, really excited and then he said uh then i said yeah we're gonna play bob's exodus and everyone's face got got white with fear <laughs> because they had never actually played exodus before uh now now i as the as the drummer was thinking to myself the whole time you know all, all i'm gonna play is a maraca right it doesn't matter if we play beethoven's fifth symphony i'm gonna be <laughs> rocking the maraca no big deal and so I go back to the back lounge, let the let the band sort of sort of soak in their fear, and and they and I heard them. They got the CD out and they started practicing Exodus, and they did <laughs> figure it out. They're they're very adept. So fast forward to our show that night. It's a beautiful night, and people love us. It's a, a really warm crowd. You never really know when you open up for another big man how it's going to be. These folks love what we were doing, and I thought to myself, man, this is going to be it great night it's gonna be a great tour a great summer santana takes the stage tears the roof off the place uh it's ecstatic he uh we get to the middle of his show and he brings the band down he looks over at us we're all on the side of the stage i got my shaker and he he's in, invites us to come on stage and i'm walking up uh to be out in out on the stage and i look up at the drum set player his name's horacio el negro hernandez one of the best drummers in the world and uh, he looks down at me and he says, Jim, come on up. You play drums. I'm going to go take a break. And then he walks and just leaves the stage. And so I'm sitting there with my shaker and I realize I got to go do something. So I go behind his kit and Carlos cues the beginning and I got to play the beat. Boom, 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 boom. It's a real simple beat. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And as I'm playing, uh my nerves start to calm down i start to look around at the stage and i realize i'm on stage with the best musicians in the world uh and carlos santana and like twenty thousand people of your 20 000 of your closest friends Twenty five thousand. Twenty. yeah there's there's an amphitheater full of people we got the jumbotrons going and, and i'm thinking this is amazing i'm playing with carlos santana and so i'm thinking this is going to be the best summer in the world I, i've never imagined being here and so uh, every so often I look down at Carlos and he's, he looks back at me and he smiles. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm bonding with Carlos Santana. Are you kidding me? 
this is nuts. Wait, I wait till I tell my mom. She's going to be very excited. <laughs> and so, so we're playing, we're playing. All of a sudden, Carlos does something that surprises me. And he brings the band down, uh, all of our volumes, and he looks back at me and he points right at me. <laughs> and when he points at me, I realize, oh my God, he wants me to take a solo. And I'm thinking in the space of three seconds, I'm thinking, is there any way I can shake him off? <laughs> but when Carlos- Build up a cramp or something. Yeah, when he's pointing at you, you gotta do something. So, so I'm behind Horatio's Battleship Star Galactica drum set, which has like 90 drums. And, I'm, and I look up and when, when you're on stage, you can see yourself on the Jumbotron sort of backwards. And I looked up and there I am. <laughs> in the headlights. And so I start playing some of the drums over here and I start playing some of the drums over here. And I start to think, man, these people are used to the best drummers in the world. I better do something fancy. And so I cross over a little bit, play some of the cymbals. And then I start these, these uh, rolling figures, you know, so the real fast triplet rolls. Like they're impressive, they're loud, they're flashy, and they make people go nuts. But well, in the middle of this, something terrible happens so music you know we count one two three four a lot so beat one is the beginning of a musical phrase and we need to know where that is so that when we're playing a crazy figure like this we know when to end it problem is in the middle of my craziness i lose track of beat one suddenly i don't know where the beginning or the end is this entire time, I am still rolling. Going That's pretty much the drummer's job. Your job is to keep one. My job is to stay where one is, and I'm gone. I'm lost. And I look up, and I see Carl Parazzo, who's the timbale player, best in the world. And he looks down at me. He's cheering me on. Go, Jim. Go, Jim. But then he realizes this terrified look on my face, and, he's, and he knows what it means. He's like, oh, you are lost. Watch me. I'll help you. And he gets his stick, and he goes like this one showing me right where beat one is i'm still rolling and i'm looking at it and he's showing it to me but every time he shows it to me i get more and more panicked and so i can't get beat one even though he's pointing right at it independent of him is the conga player raul who looks from behind carl and he yelled he's a he's a he's a big guy and he gets he gets he goes one like he's yelling at me one one both of these guys best in the world are wanting me right <laughs> trying to give me and and i can't get it i'm still rolling this whole time still rolling soon carl santana realizes there's something wrong with the young drummer <laughs> and he walks out on the stage and dude is he is so calm and collected and he looks back at me and he gives me one of these. He's like, watch me, I will help you. <laughs> right? And he gets his guitar and he looks right at me and he shows me right where beat one is. One. And I still can't get it. Wow. And I'm looking, I'm like, Carlos is trying to give me one and I can't get it and I don't know what to do. So I do the only thing I can think of, which is uh, I shut my eyes oh. because I'm having a panic attack an actual real panic attack on stage on the jumbotron in front of 30,000 people and Carlos Santana and my band panic attack. So as my eyes are closed, uh, Carlos ends the song and everyone stops dead except for me. <laughs> I keep going the whole way through the end for another five, six seconds till I realize that everyone has already stopped. And I open my eyes and I look at Carlos who looks back at me. He gives me one of these. <laughs> disgusted i run off that stage i can't get off fast enough and i lay in my bunk and i hope and pray that i can figure out what to do here because i'm just i'm a mess and i get this great idea in the middle of my uh, misery and the great idea is that i'm never going to have to do that again because there's no way no there's way. no way dude's going to have me come back on stage again yeah. and there, there's no one in the right mind that would do that and so I go to bed feeling like I can get through this. Next day in Denver, I see Carlos in the cafeteria and he comes up to me and he says, so uh, that was a rough one last night, huh, man? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, man, that was tough. And I start to apologize. He said, no, 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 no. 
And he said, so uh, we're going to try that again tonight, right? <laughs> and I look up and I hear the words come out of my mouth. Yes. And as soon as I said it, I started to panic. What did I just do? I just agreed to doing the thing I fear the most. <laughs> Fast forward to the middle of the show. I'm back on stage again, playing Exodus. Boom, 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 boom. It's back on the kit. You ever see the movie Groundhog Day? Uh-huh. Right? So this is like 6 a.m. 6 a.m. in Punxsutawney for me, right? I'm like, just, I'm back on this thing again. And I know for sure, dude's going to be pointing at me one more time. Sure enough, he brings the band down. He smiles at me and points again. <laughs> Go. And I got to take a solo again. In the middle of the solo, I start to think, whatever you do, don't mess it up. And whatever you do, don't do those stupid rolling things because that's where it got you into trouble yesterday. And as I said it in my mind, I started doing them. <laughs> and as soon as I started doing them, I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing them. And then I got lost again. Oh no. And I lost beat one again. And Carl looks at me again and goes, oh, you lost it again. I can't believe it. And he tries to help me again. He's like, you're not going to get it. Oh no. I close my eyes again. Oh no. In panic attack. I train wreck the end again. Carl stops the band. I keep going again. Oh man. And this night, he looks back at me. He's like, oh. he's just glaring at me, like, are you kidding me? You just did the same thing. So I figure, okay, I had my second chance. I blew it big time. We're up to 60,000 people now that I've failed epically in front of. <laughs> All right, no problem. Well, I figure, okay, I've, I've, I've got that. I've got, I don't have He's to do never asked you again again now. Never going to ask me again. He sees me in the hall the next day and he looks at me kind of sternly. He says, we're going to try that again tonight, right? <laughs> and again, I hear the words come out of my mouth. Yes. This is not an exaggeration. This process of me getting up and playing a terrible solo goes on for two weeks. The whole way from Boise to Colorado, to Arizona, to California. After the second night, I keep my eyes open. Right? I figure that part out. After the second night, um, I don't lose one again. So those are good progressions, but man, my solos are just not so good. Uh, we get to the last show of the entire tour. This is San Francisco. This is where his family's from. Lots of famous musicians are gonna be there. And I know, cause he's been doing it every night, he's gonna point at me again. And so one thing that I do, I, I change something. Uh, and what I change is my mindset. And the, the key thing that I change before this last show is uh, that I begin to, to see in my mind. So I, I pre-visualize what I want the solo to look like rather than panic about it. And this is something I learned in one of the one of my little uh, new agey books called Creative Visualization. And I remembered now I, I, I got to do something different. This thing's got to be good. And I thought, oh, I'll try this. And so I visualized the scenario. I could smell the, the, the popcorn and the beer. Uh, I watched the crowd smiling and dancing all in my mind to the solo that I was pretending in my mind first. And wouldn't you know, we get on stage and he brings the band down and points and I play the exact solo I had imagined mm. the whole way through to the end where Carlos cues it and I play bum, 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 And it's perfect. And the crowd's going bananas. And I looked down at Carlos and thinking, all I really care about is that he thinks it's good. And I look down and he looks back at me and he does this. He goes, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? He doesn't <laughs> like it. But then as soon as he does it, he gets a, cracks a big smile and he goes, yeah. He's just messing with me. He knows I, I want to I be doing good. And he, uh, he's just totally messing with me. And he smiles and gives me the thumbs up. And, uh, and thus helps me to understand that you know, had I given up the first time, you know, I, I, I would have been a different person. I would have been a different musician. He knew and he had, he had the, the compassion to allow me to fail over and over and over again. 
because he knew that if I had a willingness just to get back up again, eventually, <laughs> he probably didn't think it was going to take two weeks, but eventually, <laughs> I would I would get it, and uh, and I'll never I'll never forget that I'll never forget that uh, you know someone of, of his stature let me uh, you know an unknown musician really uh, come up on a stage and stink it up till I figured it out. I mean, who does that? So the the value of failure and getting back up again, uh, I can't can't say enough about how how important that was to me in being able to do what I do today. Yeah, I mean that's a real confidence builder when Carlos looks back and gives you a thumbs up. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, and so carry that through now. So the work you do today, you're trying to bring that same maybe not the same, you know, in front of 20, 30,000 people kind of level, but that same, ah, uh, I did it. And it's not that you did it right, but you did it the best you could do it. Is that, is that pretty much what now permeates your work? Uh, yes, it, it, it's really, uh, I have, I have a mission. The, the mission's all about connecting people with each other. It's about, inspiring them to go a little further than they think is possible and it's about empowering them with information that actually works so in anything that i do every workshop every class uh even the the music i make now so i still record i still play the 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 mission is about connection empowerment and inspiration and to me that's that's what any of these systems that i teach and develop are about uh you know, human connection with each other, and also that that realization of the of the big self, the true self that that is already there, uh, but sometimes gets covered up by uh, by our histories, by our our traumas. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I find over and over again how effective just simple music making can be to help that come about. And that's and that's what that's what I teach. And I think it's important to say that all everything you teach, all these methods, tried and true, scientifically sound, proven over and over again, you've witnessed them hundreds and thousands of times. Yep. Yeah, I, I've worked. I, uh, I've taught over I think over twenty five hundred uh, workshops and classes in the last fifteen years. Mm -hmm. So I've had an opportunity to to hone things, to uh, to hone my language. And to see, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what are some of the problems, what are what are the benefits, uh, and that's just my own anecdotal experience. You know, plus, we've got uh, lots of other uh, scientific uh, peer-reviewed studies that 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 demonstrate similar things. And you'll probably never ever make somebody do a drum solo in front of twenty thousand or thirty thousand people. Uh, well, if I have the opportunity, I will. <laughs> and, well, let's, let's and get I, the PNC Park. Good, good well, that's, I think it's possible. Yeah. Uh, but at, in, my, in my classes, uh, one of the things that my students do to pass some of my classes here at St. Francis is they get to take a solo in front of the whole class sitting at my chair on my drum. That's cool. And, uh, and they don't like me for a little while, but at the, at the end of the <laughs> semester, they always are thankful for it. <laughs> that's I think that's really the, the key thing is when you get to the end of that journey and you look back and you just like you say value the the, the value of failure uh, falling on your face even in front of a bunch of people that it's the thing what I what I see over and over again for myself is that if I'm not pushing myself to that edge I'm probably playing it safe and therefore probably not growing very much mm. so uh, I've developed a better relationship with my edge and I seek it out now. I look for it. If I, if I find something that feels a little like, ah, I don't want to do that. I shove myself mm -hmm. into it so that, uh, I can keep growing because if I don't and I get stagnant, then I get bored and uninspired. Uh, there's a saying that life begins at the uh, edge of your comfort zone. I think uh, that personal I, growth. Begins I agree with that. Yeah. Well, Jim Donovan, it's been a great pleasure having you on our podcast today. My pleasure. And if uh, if anyone's interested, I have a new book coming out. Uh, it's called uh, called Drum Circle Leadership, believe it or not. Uh, that should be out, uh, I'm hoping, by mid-November. They'll be able to get it on uh, Amazon Kindle. And then uh, there'll be a, a hardcover release of that. 
And the other thing that I'll be releasing, I think this month is the, uh, I have an online learning library that is uh, drum circle leadership training, sound empowerment training, uh, as well as uh, drumming play along. So this thing called Rhythmic Foundation, uh, which is based on a DVD I did years ago. And it's all, uh, all available online, it's a subscription service. And uh, you can find that at, at uh, drumcircleleadership.com. That's awesome. So people don't have to come visit you personally. They can just go online and, and learn some of these techniques as well. That's right. It's uh, for me, I've, I've done this long enough that I feel like I wanted to codify it, put it into a form so that anyone around the world can, can get the benefit and begin uh, what I like to think of as a, as a rhythmic revolution. So the more of us we're playing together, uh, the less we're fighting. Well, here, here for the rhythmic revolution. I think it's a great idea. Thanks, Jim. It's great to talk to you again. My pleasure. Thanks, Ben. That will be uh, it for today. Wicket is here again uh, to help us say goodbye. Oh, Wicket. <laughs> let's, let's be a little more careful out there. <laughs> Give thanks to uh, Jim Donovan and uh, Mike Sork behind the controls here and manager at Sorgatron Studio and uh, caretaker of this beast here. What do you think, Wicket? Are we going to do another? Oh, you're going to do another podcast? Oh, good. We'll do that. All right. We'll see you next time. You guys be careful out there.